turn them on to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be covering this morning a passage that includes verses 38 through 44. So the thing that they're the topic for today for this passage is victims of religion. And so I think it's very applicable because we're hearing more and more throughout the press that that um, religious leaders have taken advantage of people. And, and, and a big part of that has been over the years we've seen um, in, in a way where men have taken advantage of women and of girls. I want you to know that here at the church at the beach that, that the staff has been instructed. We do not delete text messages. We do not delete emails. We do not delete or alter phone records, any of those things. We try to stay above board and above reproach in all ways in order to protect ourselves and to protect you from any type uh, of situation where you could be a victim. I want you to know that if you have been a victim of religion or a victim of a religious leader, that it was not God who did that, there is no better evidence of the fallen sinfulness of man than when someone that is posing as a religious leader takes advantage of someone else. And so, know that, believe that, and we're going to be speaking today about that topic. But I do want to give you a story that I find humorous and you might or might not. Sometimes I believe that religious leaders, and by that, uh, I know that we could get on a discussion about Christianity not being a religion the way the rest of the world's religions are. I'm with you on that, and I agree to a certain extent. But I will say this, sometimes because you're a pastor and because you're up here and you're preaching and you're talking and you have an audience, Sometimes you believe that you're a little bigger than you really are, all right? And then some of those pastors that have gotten thousands upon thousands upon thousands of worshipers coming to listen to them every Sunday morning, well, I can see how over time, if they are not very guarded and they don't have a wife like my wife Kara to keep them grounded, that they would get the big head. But this is a story with me and my wife and my family yesterday. We have our two grandchildren. I, I had work in the morning, then I was studying all afternoon, and finally my wife came to me and said, 
Jay, we need to do something fun with our grandchildren. You've been reading those books all day. I've been playing. Let's go do something. And I kind of looked at the clock, and she had a good point. And I said, okay, I can give you an hour and a half to two hours tops, but then we got to come right back. So we get in, get in her car, and there we go, and we get in there, and we go to Funland. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to Funland, but I recommend it. No idea who owns the place, but it's an old-timey arcade. And if you've been to Daytona Beach or maybe one of the beaches with a boardwalk up on the eastern seaboard, maybe it would remind you of an arcade kind of in one of those places. And so you go and you play the little ski ball and you play the all kinds of different games. We had a really good time and we're sitting on a little bench in Funland and I've got my arm around Kara and we have the stroller with the five month old and then we have Harper that we're just trying to kind of keep around us and we're keeping an eye on. And I remember looking at my wife and saying, man, what a blessing. Man, this has just been a great time. Thanks for, for getting me my mind off of, of, off of work. And so we load up and we go out to her, her car and I spoke too soon because here's what's happening. So we're trying, to get into the, we're trying to get into the Jeep, and granted, we're not the best at the strollers and baby seats and all this stuff. So the first thing that happens is I can't get the baby seat off of the stroller. They're two in one, who knew? And there's some, there's some type of latch, and I've got the whole stroller with the baby seat picked up, and it won't fit in the door, of course, because they're supposed to detach from each other. I can't figure that out. So in the meantime, while Kara's getting on to me about not being smart enough to detach this car seat from the stroller, she's trying to buckle Harper in and she gets Harper's leg pinched in the seat belt of there. So Harper starts, you know, hollering, of course, as she could. Y'all know how those little pinches, they hurt worse than a big pinch. And so Harper's crying and going crazy. I'm sitting there still fighting the stroller with Sailor Grace in it, by the way. I'm sure her little five-month-old is like, what is, who is this guy? So here I'm messing with this. Kara's yelling at me on how to do it. Finally she gets over. Harper's still yelling. We get it detached. It just slides right in. It's unbelievable. Clicks right into place. <laughs> so there's that. And so now there's been words here. I get to the back of the Jeep. And, and so there's this confrontation. We had gotten Harper her prize. So we spent probably $30 on a 20 cent thing of fun dip. But the, to get all the tickets. So she's opened this up and it's got white sugar in it. Somehow between Harper screaming and Kara having it, it spills all over the back seat of the Jeep. And really it looked like, to the best of my knowledge, not that I've seen this very often, it's like, like who blew the cocaine all throughout the back of our <laughs> Jeep? So we've got the base and I'm walking around. Well, they, they've redone the inside of Funland, but they didn't redo the parking lot. There's this big crack. I fall over and sprain, my, roll over, not sprain, turn my ankle. And so as I'm falling from that and trying to get my balance, I continue to fall and I fall into this big suburban that's full of people. <laughs> I'm, and like my ankle, it's, it's, my, my father and I both have like these little ankle rolls and stuff. So I'm, I'm over laying in the front, or just kind of leaned over in the front seat of my wife's Jeep with my head down, my ankle hurting, cocaine in the back seat of my Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> my wife telling me how stupid I am for not being able to work a baby stroller. The three-year-old going nuts because we brought blood to her leg from the pinching in there. And I'm saying, I've got to get all this taken care of because I've got to get to work in the morning to preach so I can pay to fix this Suburban. <laughs> Man, how could you ever think that you're something special just because you have the gift that God's given you in order to get to serve a church and be a pastor. But if any of those pastors, if you ever know a pastor that's struggling with humility, then you can tell them, just take their grandkids to fun land. <laughs> All right. It is a serious topic, but that was yesterday afternoon in my world and in my life. So again, we're, we're doing our best. We're going to go through some training in the next six to eight months here to make sure that we're on guard as a staff and that we're doing things appropriately in the right way and that we're serving you well here at the Church at the Beach. I want you to know that today is a great passage for, for church leaders, for pastors. It's really good for us to hear, but I think by the end of it, we're going to have a point that's going to be very good for everyone here to hear. All right? And the, the, the underlying thought is this. How you treat people is going to dictate how God treats you. Now, I'm not teaching or preaching karma, 
But I want you to know that if you treat people like dogs and if you treat people like they're inferior to you, then your day is a coming. And it might be an eternity, but God's not going to put up with that forever. Other people were created in His image just like you were, and we're to respect them and to love them and to care for them. This morning I had an appropriate question from Sister Jody Asbell. She came up before the first service and said, Jay, a couple of weeks ago you told us and commanded us that we have to love people. I said, absolutely you do. And she said, are you sure? Absolutely. She said, even the tourist on Back Beach Road in the afternoon. <laughs> I said, absolutely, sister. You have to love them as well. But it would have been nice of Jesus to slide that in there just so that we knew. But we have to love people. Now today we're going to talk about Money and money can be, a, we're not going to talk about money as the main topic, but money's involved. Money's a tricky issue. The love of money is what causes problems. But money has also been, just like I talked about the mistreating women, money has been a way that religious leaders have taken advantage of people for thousands of years. And I want to share with you, this is not going to be a lesson for you today on giving more to the church. It's going to be a lesson today for you, and it was for me all week in preparation. It was a lesson to make sure that we're handling our relationships correctly. And Jesus uses money as a way to show us. I want you to know that I'm proud of this church. We have some visitors here today, and we have some people that are longtime Church at the Beach members. But on Monday... Vacation Bible School started. We had over 100 children coming in, and they were going to start getting here at 4.45 to eat. And then VBS started at 6. In case you don't know, every Monday afternoon, we have a dinner for anyone in our community that would like a warm meal. And if you would like a warm meal on Monday afternoons, please come and eat. But most of the time, 50 to 60 Five, maybe even 70% of the people that come and eat on Monday afternoons at this church, a great warm meal, many times better than what I would go home and eat, most of them are homeless. And therefore, they don't always look like me. They don't always smell like me. They don't always speak like me, walk like me, or talk like me. And for many of you, they don't with you either. But last Monday, as I was preparing and making the outline, I asked Pastor John to come into the office, and I said, I'm writing this down right now. That's how much I believe in this church. That we're going to have children coming in at 4.45 to eat, and we're going to have people coming in to grab their Monday afternoon dinner that they have received week after week after week, and we're not going to have one person come up to me and say, oh, we don't need to be helping them because the kids are around. And sure enough, we did not have one person come to me that way. We had a security team in place. Brother Tony always leads that and heads that up. And then Krista is always there on Monday afternoons. My wife Kara is there on Monday afternoons. They did what they always do. They served everybody. Everybody was safe. And I'll tell you what's really good for everybody that wants to get on their high horse about how God's blessed them and they think they've blessed themselves is this right here. Is that we had families coming in while people were walking out and they saw a church that believes in the Lordship of Jesus Christ who is serving people that don't look and act and smell and think the way they do. That was the best thing that could have happened short of little kids putting faith in Jesus this week. I'm proud of this church. Yesterday we had the dental clinic. Over 20 people came and received complimentary dental care here. I want to let you know that on Tuesday and Thursday mornings we have a food pantry. We give out thousands of dollars of food each month in order to help people that might be hurting. And people came this week and they served for two or three hours on Tuesday morning, two or three hours on Thursday morning, and then they were back in the evening to serve during vacation Bible school. What a blessing to be the body of Christ. So I'm very thankful for you. I'm very proud of you, especially this past week, for putting our best foot forward. So where, where are we in the text, in Mark chapter 12? Well, we're Wednesday of Passion Week. What's Passion Week? It's the week leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
the setting of this, what we're going to read today, it's in the temple in Jerusalem a couple thousand years ago. And there were different levels of the temple. The outside area, the courtyard, would have been the court of Gentiles. Then inside that, the court of women. That was for Hebrew or Israelite women. Then inside that, the court of Israel. And that could just be Hebrew or Israelite men. And then you went into where the priests could go. And that was the Holy of Holies. And so that's kind of how this temple complex went. And in this court of women, there were 12 trumpet-shaped bowls going around. And in these trumpet-shaped bowls, is where people, they would come each week and they would throw their gifts, throw their money into these trumpet-shaped bowls and they would walk around and act like how important they were. And you know how it goes. Then there would be somebody that would just have to come in and just give what they had and then scurry on back out of the scene. We've gone through this process in the book of Mark where Jesus had been asked a bunch of questions, then Jesus asked the religious elites a question, and now we've gotten to a point where Jesus has started, and he, he has started talking about condemning and judging the religious elites. So today we're not talking about giving because before and after this section that preachers for years and years have used for giving lessons, we're going to see that really Jesus is talking about judgment and condemnation. Now, we're going to talk about scribes or lawyers here in just a minute, very briefly. You need to know that the scribes or the lawyers, they would take care of a widow's estate. She didn't have a man to take care of everything, then the scribe or the lawyer, the religious leader, would come in and they would make sure things are in order. Now, the religious leaders, the religious leaders also had taught the Jewish people that if you will give money, then God has to bless you. And that's simply not true. I'll stand before you today and tell you that I have given my money and I've given my money for years to this church and the churches that I have worshipped at and been a member of, but never one time has anything I've done ever made him do anything. So ladies and gentlemen, let's keep proper perspective with our giving and let's overall realize that this passage is not about money. So here we go, the condemnation from Jesus, Mark chapter 12, verse 38, 39, and verse 40. Read with me. Then Jesus said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces. They love the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feast. They devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Jesus said, not Jay, Jesus says, these type people re will receive greater condemnation. Jesus is upset with them. He's not very happy. You know, we could probably relate these things in the Bible to things that we have going on today. Long robes. The religious elites, they would wear these long robes with tassels, and they would walk around, and, and they would... They would be all high and mighty, and they would, they would act all important. They would go around. i got to tell you, I'm proud of this sport coat, the, the, the green one I wore last week. I'm, Lord willing, going to have on a melon orange colored one ne next week. I had on the green one last week, $8 a piece at Steinmark. My wife walked in, I saw them, and I was, I was like, oh, no, we don't have money for that. She said, $8 a piece. I told her she's the best shopper in the world to keep going. So they all were all important with their long robes, all high and mighty. The greetings, they love the greetings. Oh, rabbi, teacher, faithful one, yada, yada, yada. i never forget, I got here, got back and said, Okay, Jay, now that you're back, what are we supposed to call you? I don't know, I reckon Jay. <laughs> I guess that's what you should call me. My mama decided it was good enough. They wanted the best seats. In the synagogue. Y'all remember that when we were kids? You would have high church. My daddy did it. He's a fairly humble guy. But the preacher and maybe one or two other people would sit up here on the stage. And they were important. And nothing against my daddy. But why in the world would we all want to look at him for a full hour, you know? <laughs> How important do you have to think you are? But they wanted the best seats in the synagogue is what these religious elites. They wanted the best seats in the banquet. Which means when they went to a party and it was a dinner party, they didn't want to sit down at the other end. They wanted to sit right beside the rich person or the powerful person that was hosting the party. Jesus is telling us he doesn't like people like that. And the long prayers covered, they devouring, they were devouring the widows' houses. 
They knew that the man was gone. They knew that the woman didn't have any rights per se to take care of all this stuff or the ability. And so the lawyers would come in and they would take for themselves and they would take for the temple and then the women would be without their home or they would be without sufficient means to take care of themselves. And Jesus knows it's going on and he doesn't like it. Verse 40 says, greater condemnation. I'm telling you, I don't want that. I believe because of faith in Jesus Christ that I'm going to avoid condemnation overall, but I don't want any part of Jesus being angry or upset with me the way he was these old boys. So where do we go from here? Jesus teaches, and we find out in the next few verses, the setting or the scene or what occurred to upset Jesus so much. Now before I do that, I've got a list that John MacArthur came up with from the Bible condemning false teachers. People who do not just preach God's word and the truth of the good news of Jesus. MacArthur's list includes names, these names. The false teachers that cause people to be a victim of religion. They're blind men who know nothing. They're mute dogs, dreamers who love to slumber, demented fools, reckless, treacherous men, ravenous wolves, blind guides of the blind. They're hypocrites, fools, whitewashed tombs full of bones, serpents, a brood of vipers, thieves and robbers, savage wolves, slaves of their own appetites, hucksters peddling the word of God, false apostles, deceitful workers, servants of Satan, purveyors of a different gospel, the Bible calls them dogs, evil workers, enemies of the cross of Christ, those who are conceited and understand nothing, men of depraved minds, deprived of the truth, men who have gone astray from the truth, they're captives of the devil, they're the deceivers, they're ungodly persons, and they're unreasoning animals. Lord, help us to never fall into that category. But if our pride ever gets in the way, we very easily can. So here's what evidently Jesus saw that made him so mad to condemn the religious leaders. Follow with me, Mark chapter 12, verse 41. We're going to go through verse 44. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Now we've already talked about that in the court of women there at the temple. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites. So that's less than two pennies which made a quadrants. So, he, so Jesus called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. Hmm. Well, here's the setting. Jesus is sitting over in the corner the court of women before him. The trumpet-shaped bowls where people are coming and putting money. So they come and Jesus is just watching and he sees what's happening. And so then, throughout the temple, probably teaching, talking about Jesus, sharing the good news, he then, Jesus, summons and calls his 12 apostles to him. And he's sitting over in the corner and there they are. And he's talking with them. He says, watch this. Watch what's going on in my house. Just yesterday, I turned over the tables because I was so angry at what they were doing in this temple, and now here I am back today, and this has occurred. This is not a lesson on giving, folks. If you want a lesson on giving, I'll tell you this. Come to this church, serve God with all you've got, and give abundantly, give regularly, and give cheerfully. End of story. For now. That's your lesson on giving. Jesus is concerned much more with the proportion of what you give than the portion of what you give. But Jesus had showed the elites ignorance a few passages ago in the Bible. And after showing their ignorance, he teaches on condemning them for what he had just seen. But what did Jesus see? Jesus saw these religious elites that were walking around and patting the good old boys on the back because they were dumping a bunch of money in the treasury for them to take and then to go spend as the religious leaders. 
And then Jesus sees this woman who goes and has, for the record, just as a side note, Mark writes and uses, compares it to a Roman coin. So that's kind of how we know that Mark's writing to some Roman Gentiles with his gospel. But Jesus sees this woman come up with less than two pennies and drop them in, and then she walks off. If we study this term, a woman of poverty, and we study it in the Greek language, the original language that it would have been written, did you know that really it was extreme poverty? And the picture that we are given here is that, is that this lady was coming up and she gave her last anything to the temple and she was going home to die. She was not going to be able to have any food, no care. We'll miss this if we're not careful. The religious leaders were allowing this woman to go give her money and then go home and starve to death. And Jesus sees it. And you've had preachers tell you forever that, oh, this is a great lesson on how we just give sacrificially and we give sacrificially hogwash. Because if you take that approach, that means you're also teaching that I'm supposed to have everybody come up here and give every last cent they have and then go home and starve to death and I'm not going to do it. If you eat steak every night, I might tell you you should give a little more, but doggone it, you're not going to be able, you're not going to go without electricity and die of heat exhaustion because you don't have A.C. in Panama City Beach, Florida during the summer. And Jesus is disgusted by this. He's looking at his apostles and he called them close to him. And church, this is what I'm telling you as well. He's saying, boys, something new's coming and you better not act like them or I'll come after you too. I don't think this ever left the apostles' mind. They might have tripped up sometimes, but when the church was birthed and everything just took off like wildfire and people were sharing and people were caring and people were loving, they knew we better not be like those religious leaders that make victims of the people who are following them. So that's what we're learning from this passage. Not that you're supposed to come give this church or me all your money. The woman went home to die. Well, how is this going to change your life? You have choices if you're a Christian. I urge you to find a church that sticks to biblical truth, centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those of you that are church at the beach members, you know we do our absolute best to do that. You see, I'll sit back and I'll watch, and I see this setting now in churches where I have, I've seen this literally, and, and I am vain enough that I try to see what other churches are doing for best practices. We implement some, some we say that's not for us. But I see some churches that say on social media, come by this Sunday morning and get baptized and, and try something new with Jesus. Almost like try it for 30 days, and if it's not what you want, you can turn it back in. And then I see these other churches that are so proud and they're so on their high horse that we don't do that, we're not like that. We have a 45-step program that before anybody can be put faith in Jesus, they have to cover all the bases and go through all the steps. And I'm not trying to ride the middle road as a pastor. What I'm telling you is, is that, it's, that baptism and following Jesus Christ is way more than just something new to try in life. But I'm telling you right now that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, according to the Scriptures alone. And if you start adding stuff in, you're just as bad as the person who's taking stuff out. So stick to biblical truth. Remember for the second time today, that the way that you treat other people is going to dictate how God treats you. So before you let your mind and heart go there towards someone, remember that. So my final point is this. About following a false teacher that would cause you to be a victim. You have your prosperity-centered prosperity teachers and preachers. They'll make you feel good and think that you're going to go win the Powerball. And then you have the legalistic teachers 
that don't like the fact that I, I preach and believe that salvation is by faith alone. Here's the problem for you. And a problem for me, but a problem for you. I'll finish the story of the woman with this. She, and, she had been taught and she believed that if she went and gave her last two pennies, that God was required to bless her and provide for her. And so if all we know of the story is the story, then not only did the woman go home and die, but she went home and died without faith in God. But she went home and died with faith in a religious system that was false and didn't work. Which means this woman would have died and gone to hell. Jesus could have stopped her. Jesus could have stopped the religious leaders. But instead, Jesus sat back and said, I'm about to institute this church. And you boys better not turn this church of mine into what these men have turned this temple into. Be careful. It's a serious matter if you start following a false teacher. Yeah.